right, got one more talk this block. And that is coming to you from John Harris, who is going to be giving us a tour of the lost roguelikes. <laughs> super excited about. John, wow. are you yeah, ready? I, I, I can't have, uh, yeah, okay, I'm going, I won't be able to see you uh, on uh, screen because I I'm screen sharing for the slides and gameplay. Yeah, that's so. fine. If if I need your attention, I will start talking. You can hear me, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm coming right. at you from a friend's house, by the way, since he has a better room for, for streaming from. So that's his collection of Deadpool figures in the background. Um, uh, just a sec. I'm going to turn off the sound from the, uh, the, the, the screen. All right. Then the... Uh, the I, I've got the chat open in another window. So, all right. So, um, and let's see. I, I I'll need your you to tell me what how time is looking. Okay. Oh yes. Hello? If okay. if you're, you want a five minute warning? Uh yeah. Two minute yeah. warning? Yeah, because the the the, the slide projector has uh it, it's obscured the task bar, so I can't see the time. All right, I'll jump in when you've got five minutes. All right. My talk is on the lost roguelikes. I'm sorry, by the way, that the screen is framed like this, uh, just as for like, my head. Um, so the lost roguelikes. Uh, that would be Advanced Rogue 5, fast playing. Advanced Rogue 7, got lots of classes. Super Rogue, it's quick to play and weird. Ultra Rogue, it's forgotten and influential. And I just actually found a binary of it, finally, for the first time a couple of days ago. X Rogue, which is uh, the the ultimate end of the advanced rogue tree, and Larn, which is very weird, very different, and awesome. Um, okay, so about this. Uh, okay, for who the heck am I? I'm John Harris. Pronounce they them. Uh, I wrote the the column at play a while back, which uh, for Game Set Watch. Much of it's compiled in the book Exploring Roguelike Games from CRC Press. I write various weird books on games for story bundles, some of which make their way to rodneylives.itch.io, if you that sounds interesting to you. One of these is We Love Mystery Dungeon, which I think you guys will really like. This talk was almost on Mystery Dungeon, but I also pitched doing one of the Lost Rogue likes and they like the uh, uh, I think it just barely edged it out. I'm also at Rodney Lives on Twitter, warning voluminous. I tweet a lot. And there's my switch friend code if that is at all interesting. Okay. So, the early years of roguelikes. This is back in the days, back in the day. Uh, previous talk talked a bit about the Play-Doh games, uh, Pianet 5 and D&D, &D and a few others. Those aren't really roguelikes, but they look a bit like them. And then there's Neath Apple Manor, which has many of the major aspects of roguelikes. Though I still think that Rogue is, is like the best, combining of all the different concepts into one game. So uh, you notice uh, on this screen here, I have four different, uh, I have three different uh, colored things. Those are to indicate sort of the line, lineage of these games. Um, like Moria, for example, there in green, uh, inspired you Moria later on, 1988, and a 1990 Angband. And Similarly, Hack there in red, Hack 1.0 gave rise to NetHack 1.3D and then NetHack 3.0 and modern NetHack today. Well, Rogue had a system, had a, had a line of these games too. Um, and those kind of uh, kind of petered out. I don't think you can see it actually behind a, a StreamYard message, but um, the, the last one was in 1991, X Rogue down there, but also Advanced Rogue, Super Rogue, and Ultra Rogue. These were all games that were played on college and, and in college computer labs and mainframes and timeshare systems. And they're not, yeah, they're, they're not much talked about today, which is a real shame. So I'm here to try to introduce you to these games, tell you how you can play them now, and hopefully inspire you to, to look them up. So. So let's talk about Rogue a little bit, uh, just to recap. Each dungeon level, it, it's a, it's it's like in the standard, in the old D&D &D Mega Dungeon style of uh, a dungeon that starts 
like on a first level and then goes down and gets harder as you get deeper. And each dungeon level in Rug is made of a three by three grid of ro rooms collected by collected by corridors. Uh, you have to collect food and find a way down to avoid starving to death. Uh, yeah. You find random items along the way that can be identified by either using them or by using scrolls of identify on them. You have to maintain your hit points and strength, build experience, and finally maintain good weapons and armor as you go. You can't go upstairs until you ob obtain the Amulet of Yendor, which starts appearing in the dungeon at around level 26. 26 is kind of the magic number of Rogue, by the way. A lot of things in the game are centered around the number 26. There are 26 kinds of monsters. There are 26 levels in the game. It's it's very interesting. Uh, yeah. So this is a, a mock-up of a Rogue-style level. Uh, it's, you know, it's each of these grid uh, grid sections on the screen. These sectors can either contain a room or just like passageways or branching corridors. And they're all connected. And once you've pl seen a few of these types of levels, you get a good feel of how the levels will be laid out. And you can start sort of predicting what, uh, what dungeon levels are going to be like as you explore them and get a sense of where there might be secret rooms, which is important to the game, in fact. I bring all of this up, I remind you, of it because... All of these games, except for Larn, everything I've said so far mostly is pretty much true about. Uh, they're, they all use the rogue-style level generation. They're all Mega Dungeon-style games where you go down and the game gets harder to go down. The items that you're looking for might be different. Um, the number of levels might be different. Ultra Rogue, it turns out, has 100 levels, like Angband does. Uh, but once you've played Rogue, you have a good sense of how to proceed in the other games. So... These games were rescued from obscurity by uh, something called the Roguelike Restoration Project, which began in 2000 by someone who identified on the website as Yindor. It uh, has a number of versions of Rogue, Advanced Rogue, X-Rogue, all these games on it. Uh, also had a version of Rogomatic, which was an uh, early Borg or automatic player. It's a computer program that itself played Rogue, and very well, in fact. Uh, if I remember correctly, the little factoid, it was created by the eventual founder of the, the early internet search engine Lycos. I think Michael Maldolin, I think his name is. Anyway, I don't know what he's doing now. Anyway, that's a few uh, rescued binary versions of some of these games. Worked right up on that in 2006. I wrote about a couple of games from it back on App Play long ago in the before times. These days, uh, these games are being worked and maintained by something called Roguelike Restoration Project Fork, uh, maintained by John Elwin Edwards. I put his, uh, it's his GitHub name here, but really it's his, I think the username on Mercurial. That's a mistake in the slide. It started working on it around 2012, and he con the, uh, uh, continues to work on them to this day. And these are the version of the game that I'll be showing off to you today if there is time. Uh, he doesn't have a working version of Ultra Rogue. I've been in contact with the creator of Ultra Rogue, Herb Chong, who is still alive and in kicking. And he is uh, he found a copy of a two, an unreleased 2.0 of the game that they were working on and trying to get it working and release that. And I wish him the best of luck in that. And I hope uh, I hope that he can bring that you know to the world and that it can he'll help maybe revive this game in the modern era. Uh, he also has the version of Advanced Rogue 7 on the on Adv Rogue Administration Project Fork also doesn't quite work. I'll be getting to that in a minute. I had to fix a couple of bugs in this in order to get it working for you guys, and I think there might still be some bugs. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Anyway, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, there, he, he makes available Windows versions, but he also has some issues with Microsoft's registration requirement for Visual Studio. So it looks like he won't be providing Windows versions in the future. And he doesn't supply uh, binaries either. He only supplies the source code. Let me go back, yeah. So I had to comp I, uh, compile these, but I have, and I'm uh, making them available for you to download and play so you don't have to compile them yourself. I will have the link later on. Um, let's move on. Yeah, I also hope to be showing you ver uh, a version of Larn, which is another uh, old roguelike game. It's a very different one. 
There's really no other game quite like Lard. It's a very interesting game. It takes the roguelike ideas and turns them around and makes something uh, uh, really unusual and special out of them. It's not as hard as your standard roguelike. It's still pretty difficult. But there are so many weird and cool things about it. And I hope to be able to get to, uh, to, uh, talk to you about those. But that depends on whether we can get to that slide in time. So let's move on. So uh, it's about the source. Uh, there is the URL right there for the, the files that I'm making available. Uh, I will provide that in the breakout room after the talk. Okay, so caveat. It says here, I worked hard on the presentation and playing these games. We try to be as accurate as possible, even though there's a source diving to confirm some behaviors, but these are complex games and a delight in weird behavior with mysterious causes. Uh, on the information given in this presentation, no warranties are offered either expressed or implied. This is especially true of the production from A Rogue 5 to A Rogue 7 to X Rogue and early A Rogue to U Rogue and so on. So on. Also, I give dates, or I gave dates earlier for these games, but many of them were worked on for several years, and uh, so it's it's not really clear if some of these features originated in one game or were brought in from another game, uh, especially in regards to Ultra Rogue and Hack, which came out about the same year, but sort of were were developed concurrently for a while. So, any case. Moving on. Uh, so, commonalities, yeah. Most of these games are ultimately descendants of Advanced Rogue, of which we have two versions. Uh, Ultra Rogue branched off from 1.0, which I'm not showing, um, and X Rogue branched off from Advanced Rogue 7. All these uh, the original Rogue only had stat, uh, only had strength for a stat. I'm tripping over my words. Um, let's see. Whereas all the other games have at least four or five of D and D's six stats, uh, a couple of them have all six. Anyway, um, see, A Rogue Five and successors have an extra category of item from beyond those in Rogue, which were potions and scrolls and such. He also has something called miscellaneous magic, which has some particularly powerful items in it, um, and also they can also be very dangerous items. Some of them can just kill you from using them, so you have to be very careful playing around with, like, bags of dust. It might be dust of disappearance, or it might be dust of choking. Um, the AI and of the monsters in the games has it, is in, uh, advanced a bit beyond that from Rogue. Now monsters are smart enough to run away from you if a fight isn't going well for them. And they know enough not to bother if they're trapped in a corner. They have enough awareness of their surroundings that if they see that they can't run away from you without getting trapped, they'll just go ahead and fight you where they're standing. Uh, but if they can find the loop of rooms to run through, that you can just chase them forever and you'll never catch them. It's it, it's really clever how, how the monsters are in this game. Uh, there are also magic pools in these dungeons. Have you ever played Rogue? Yeah, that's something that's not in those games. It's, uh, it's, some, it's, a, it's a spot in the dungeon that you can stand on and dip items into, and it could either bless them, you can, you can gain like pluses on them or it can curse them and it's just one of those things that later roguelikes tend to have and it's just like another way to trip up new players usually anyway i say anyway a lot yeah um all these games use the same weapon and armor from rogue although advanced rogue 5 has also add battle axes ultra rogue adds lots of new things it's 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 yeah uh, I'm writing these lists here to try to to help you. If you have, if you decide to try to play these games, you might it might be useful to know this. Rogue and its successor games all have these same weapons, and they all have the same sort of relative power levels. It's not obvious when you're playing what that is. So the weakest weapons are daggers and spears, and the strongest weapons are two-handed swords. And that gives you this here. And the weakest armor is leather armor, and the best armor is plate armor. So that's on this slide here. You can see that later. Yeah. So the Vance Rogue 582 is based on Rogue by Toy Arnold and Witchman. It was headed by Michael Morgan and Ken Dalka. It offers four character classes, which is something that's not in Rogue. It's fighter, magician, cleric, and thief. They actually don't play that differently from each other. Uh, if, you, if you're going to play this, this game, you should know fighters have the easiest time because 
they, they start with a lot of strength, and strength not only helps your uh, your attack damage, but it also increases how much you can carry without take, suffering from food penalties. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you start out playing as fighters. Uh, the other classes have their have advantages. Thieves can backstab sleeping creatures. Uh, magicians, if they start out with enough intelligence, start out with an identify spell, which changes the game tremendously. If you can just cast identify from memory and not have to rely on scrolls, it completely changes the whole nature of the game. So if the item system in Rogue, having to identify things and possibly, possibly suffer the effects of bad items causes you trouble then try a try a magician in one of these games and you'll find that it it it, it helps out helps you out a bit yeah um i should mention one thing about the game is that some of these games put you through a whole character creation phase before you play where you have to assign stat points to various to various attribute scores but this game um, it rolls for you gives you a set of stats and asks if you want to re-roll as a result, it's it's much faster to get started in Advanced Rogue Five than some of these other games. Uh, you can you can be started and play, playing in less than a second if you want. One of the things about roguelikes that I've found over the years that the longer it takes to get started playing the game, uh, the worse it is. How to put it like um, since these are games where if you die you have to start over your next game, all the time it. The time you've been playing it is sort of like the ante, about your, your, your bet in a game of poker. Because um, if you die, it's basically the time of that game you've wasted. You have to, you know, hopefully playing the game was fun, but if you're really trying to win, well, you know, you've lost all that progress. You have to start over. So the longer it takes to play through the game, sort of uh, uh, the higher the stakes are. So if you if it's a game in which players are intended to to win, or learn a lot from death, then you should make death as painless as possible. It should be as easy as possible to get back into the game and get started again. Anyway, that's just some personal philosophy there. Uh, there's the yeah fighter type. I already mentioned that magician. Yeah, I've already mentioned all this stuff. Interesting thing about thieves is they actually end up by on the average with fewer hit points than magicians, which I was surprised by. Uh, humanoid monsters can find and use the kind of weapons the player can have. It can make them unexpectedly dangerous, in fact. I got one shot by a gnome on level one before because the darn thing found a two-handed sword. Um, and in dark corridors and rooms, kobolds with arrows or rocks, they're lethal because they can see you from a distance. And you not, might not even know what direction they're firing at you from, and you'll just die before before you even see your assailant. It's a good idea on to if you find missile weapons on the ground, to pick them up just so another monster can't come across them, find them, and then throw them at you later. The interesting thing about this game and its successors is you can actually go back up dungeon levels. You don't have to go all the way down until you find a relic like the Amulet of Yendor before the game will let you go back up. You can go up from level one and explore the outside world which is this weird wilderness. It's, it's kind of surprising to find in a game from 1984, 1985. Uh, I don't really know what purpose it serves, though. I don't really know why you should go out there, but it's there. Anyway, um, Experience levels are not as frequent in these games and in the original row. You have to actually fight more monsters before you can get a level. Um, anyway. One of the reasons I want you to play these games, by the way, as I mentioned at the bottom point here, is that I think games are kind of dead if people aren't playing them. In the process of playing a game, you animate it. You inhabit it. It becomes alive. It exists as a thing as long as you are experiencing it. And I hope, yeah, so as long as people are playing them, I think that they won't. They don't. They're not actually dead. They're not actually lost. So I, I kind of. That's what I'm. That's why I'm giving this talk. I sort of want. I feel badly for them. I want people to experience them again. Anyway, that's just me. Uh, so, I've compiled numbers in each of these games just sort of give you some idea of what's in them. 
So advanced red pack has 17 scrolls, 10 armor, 17 weapons, 12 potions, 24 rings, 20 sticks, 22 miscellaneous magic items, 11 artifacts, and 118 kinds of monsters. Uh, those sound like a lot, but many of these are easily outdone by its successors. Um, it's the thing about the game is that some of Rogue's worst items, like the potions of blindness, confusion, and paralysis, are not in these games. That's because uh, miscellaneous items can be cursed, and not just equipment. Generally, in roguelikes, cursed items are just equipment items, and what's bad about them is that you can't stop using them once you equip them. But starting in these games, you'll find ordinary magic items, like potions and scrolls can be cursed too. And that can make a usually good item have a bad effect. So the potion of blindness in Advanced Rogue 5 was replaced by cursed potions of the invisible. So you can identify as potion of the invisible, but if you don't know what its curse status is, it can still be bad for you. You should probably keep that in mind if you try to, try to play these. So I played my first five games of Advanced Rogue 5, and this is how I died on each. Uh, three of the games, I got killed by a monster throwing things at me in the dark. So you should take that as an indication of what's going to be killing you if you play this. So Advanced Rogue 7. There's uh, five more classes in this over Advanced Rogue 5. Druids are another kind of spellcaster. Assassins are kind of like a super kind of thief. Paladins and rangers are uh, composite characters that can both fight and have magic spells. But they're both expected to play by a code of conduct, where if you see a sleeping monster, you're expected not to attack it. If you do, you have a chance of losing all of your special power and just becoming a straight fighter from then on. And if you're used to playing in the ordinary way, it's, it's probably going to chip you up. I found that out several times. Yeah. And then there are monks, which are one of those weird classes from D and D, like bards. Monks are a kind of fighter that fight best without wearing weapons or armor, so that can exempt them from having to find equipment and improve them and protect your equipment. Uh, but it also has certain drawbacks, like in fights, enemy if your 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 opponents tend to hit you before you can hit them. I'm not really sure why. I think it has to do with simulating old Advantage of the Dragon's weird uh, segment timing system, which, that's like a talk in its own. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just let that pass here. Um, let's see. Most classes are now restricted in what equipment they can use. You can't just find anything, you, you can't just use anything you find in the dungeon floor anymore. If you're not a fighter type, you can't use the best weapons and armor. Um, this is, game has a complete character creation phase, unlike Advanced Rogue 5, it takes longer to get started. And you're also thrown into a trading post to buy your starting equipment. And you really have to, otherwise you're just going to start the game with nothing, not even food. So that's a bit annoying, yeah. Uh, many of new items are in this. Many streets in the, dun uh, the Dungeon of the Dragon DM guide, such as Key Autumn's Ointment which can heal you multiple times, like the heal pots from Shiren the Wanderer. Monsters can now generate in groups, and you'll be encountering those a lot in the early in the early stages of the game. Um, okay, here's that bug. Hey there, this is your five-minute warning. Wow, I'm just... I know. <laughs> We've well, had some requests for Larn, if you want to skip ahead. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and play Larn a bit. Uh, I've got it right here. This is actually fairly far into the game. Narn has 13 dungeon levels. And uh, this is level 8. It says question mark because I fell down a couple of levels in. The game obscures what level you're on if you fall down a trap door. It, it, it's, it, it's just, it, it doesn't let you know how close you are to the surface there. So this is Larn. It's a weird game. It's the, the double generation is completely different from Rogue, as you can see. It uses what I call imperfect mazes. A perfect maze is a maze where from one point in the maze to another, there's only one route. And Larn, I, I, uh, NetHack and Hack and Super Rogue, they all use perfect mazes sometimes. But the thing about perfect mazes is that there's only one way to get from one place to another. You always have to go past the same spaces to, 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 navigate, to navigate the terrain. 
Whereas in an imperfect maze, you have choices. You can choose, uh, make decisions about which is the best way to go. So instead of being forced to go the same way every time. So let's to see if I can find a monster. There is a book. Read the book. It, oh, it gave me the spell Flood. Uh, that sounds dangerous to just be able to summon water at a, at a whim, but Magic Scroll of Time Warp. One of the things about Lauren is that it doesn't have a food system. Instead, it has a time limit. You have a time limit of 300 mobiles in order to save your daughter from a disease, dianthritis, that she's contracted. And the ultimate goal of the game is to find the potion of cure dianthritis, which is at the bottom of the hardest of the hardest dungeon. There's two dungeons. There's a 10 level dungeon, that's the main one, and a three level volcano with super tough monsters and the potion at the end of it. Uh, a mobile is 100 game turns, but a scroll of time warp will turn the clock back, in this case by one mobile, and give you more time to win. The time limit's not really very. Oops, there's a roth. Killed it. Uh, a time limit's not really much of a problem. Um, if you win the game, then the next time you play the game, difficulty goes up. And if you've increased the difficulty a few times, the time limit might get to be more of a problem. I haven't gotten that far, so I can't tell you for sure. Uh, magic Potion. Another thing we were thinking about Larn, this is Larn HD, by the way, which is a relatively modern remake. There are tons of versions of Larn out there. There's been over a dozen. This is a game that people tend to remake every so often. And yeah, it, it's it's you don't hear so much about it, but there are definitely people that remember it and were influenced by it. And it's so different from other roguelikes because of things like the time limit. There's things like there's a town level. Some people say it's the first game with a town level. I'm not sure if it's it or Moria really that was. But in the town, there is a trading post that you can sell. I don't think find the dungeon, and it's an important source of money. There is a store that you can buy the ultra-powerful Lance of Death in, which can one-shot kill any monster. But uh, the hardest monsters have a high evasiveness, and it's hard to hit them with it. And it's also very expensive. Uh, there's also a college that you can spend time and money in in order to gain, uh, to gain skills that can be useful in the dun in dungeon exploration. It can make, help you fight better and give you better stats. Anyway, uh, there's some money. Oh, God, it is Enchantress. I hate it. Uh, okay, I'm going to cast Magic. Uh, I cast a Lightning Bolt at her. At her um, oh, IT. Spellcast. Spellcasting is done when you re... Yeah, let me, let me show you. Cast. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, when you read books, you learn spells, and the spells are on this list that you've learned throughout the game. But you don't have to bring up the list. Instead, each spell has a three character uh, code. You can just enter the code if you want to cast the spell quickly. Um, oh, I don't want to cast the spell. Let's see, any questions while we're going through this? That's so you've got me. just about a minute left. Yeah. Uh, so if you have any final parting thoughts, uh yeah 30 minutes i really planned a ton of things but one of the things that, oh i got the level 12. uh my slides are in the in the dropbox in which i have the game files and everything and every basically everything i wanted to say is in the slides you wanted to page through them i also have my notes which have a ton of information that i've that, that i've discovered throughout the game uh the game throughout my preparation for this talk. Um, and really, I think you'll get the information from that may, probably more effectively than if I just spoke it aloud. So it, it, you can kind of think of it as like another uh, at play column if you, if, if you enjoyed that back in the, time, in the day. Cool, um, yeah. If you want to drop those links in the space hangar or give them to us and we will distribute them via Twitter. I'm not sure what you what, how to access the space hangar actually. That's fair. We can we can talk about it offline. Yeah, that'd um, be great. But thank you for this. I've never I'd never heard of Larn before this talk, and I'm totally fascinated. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's uh, it, 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 it's it's a cool game. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really know what else to say. I'm sorry for tripping over my words so much. I would have liked to have rehearsed this more, but I was discovering new things. Uh, like just a couple of hours ago, I was fixing the a couple of bugs in Advance Rogue Seven. That's nasty crash bugs that just dropped the game <laughs> to shell, just unexpectedly. Just immediately, your game is over. Have a DOS prompt. It's and something I want to make sure the chat caught because um, I watched your you know your backup talk uh, yeah. is that you actually went in and fixed bugs in these old games and like submitted pull requests so that we could we could so that they would be playable again and I just think that's like so that's just what is so beautiful about the roguelike community I just thought that was really cool. Yeah. Actually, I haven't submitted a, re uh, bug, uh, a bug report yet because I'm not sure how to in Mercurial, which is where the source co the sources are up. And I don't even know actually if that's meant to be something that a an end user can do. I'm trying to contact the person who is maintaining them, and I haven't found a point of contact information yet. If if you're watching this, let me know. I my uh, I'm, uh, Rodney lives on Twitter. Please get in touch with me. I can I fix these bugs. I can just give you the source files that I hacked up, or I, I know what what's causing the bugs. I can tell you. Just get in touch with me. There okay? you go. 